And don't think I forgot about the raven. The cabin scene starts with a close-up of the raven's eye, and it slowly zooms out. Now, the raven blinks exactly four times before the men enter the cabin. Darkness is always there, watching and waiting. This is what I intuit from this shot from, from the raven. The doctor is never seen entering the cabin, however, which means something is missing, and there will be more questions and answers, hinting yet again at the incomplete or unsolvable nature of Laura's murder. The raven is a is a uh, thonic creature. However you wish to um, view this, it's often associated with death, as well as many other things. But the raven is a trickster. And really, it's, it's neither hero nor villain, but it's a messenger between worlds. It reminds me of the inhabitants of the Black Lodge with its clouded white eyes in this image. This bird is a physical correlate. And when I say the, the residents of the Black Lodge, I don't think they show the Black Lodge ever. I think the Red Room is just the plenum. I don't think it's necessarily the Black Lodge. It's just the waiting room. You could go to the Black Lodge or you could go to the White Lodge. Just want to clarify that. So the, the bird here is a physical correlate to the metaphysical uh, plenum. So, so this bird is this messenger between these two, these two worlds, these two places, okay? And uh, which, of course, the, the Black Lodge is... So this bird kind of represents hanging the, the soul hanging in the balance. Will, will your soul be annihilated forever? Uh, it, with, if facing the dweller on the thre- threshold with imperfect courage, your soul is utterly annihilated and you go to the Black Lodge, or will you go to the White Lodge? And this bird is watching, right? It's a very, uh, it's a very interesting scene. Now, early into the next episode, Waldo is taken to the Twin Peaks Sheriff's Office. This scene makes me laugh because Agent Cooper takes out his tape recorder and sets it to voice activation mode. He then tells Sheriff Truman, when the bird talks, maybe we'll get some answers. (laughs) So poor Waldo here uh, is locked up at the police station being interrogated as an accomplice to Laura's murder. So it's kind of cute. So now we're at the uh, first episode of season two. So we've gone forward a little bit here. And this is, of course, the episode where Agent Cooper is laying on the floor, having been shot by an unknown assassin. And we have this awkward scene with the old man bringing Coop a glass of warm milk. This scene feels eerily similar to the Red Room scene in Cooper's dream from early on in the first season, both of which occurring with Agent Cooper in his hotel room, and there seems to be that oddly similar sound of a singing bowl in the background, just like in Dale's dream of the Red Room. Remember when the arm's rubbing his hands together and you hear that sound? That sound comes back in this scene as well. So the waiter leaves and comes back a few times, sort of lingering around, as Agent Cooper presumably goes in and out of consciousness. The senile old waiter is unconsciously communicating the final moments of one's life. He leaves the frame, then comes back into view a few, uh, several times without any uh, profound or meaningful statements at all to offer, which represents in my mind Agent Cooper coming in and out of consciousness as his life hangs in the balance. This scene is so skillfully, uh, is so skillfully transmits an awkward silence and an absurd senility of one's final moments as the afterlife unceremoniously approaches. So it's a, it's a very powerful scene. Now, after the old man finally leaves for good, Then the giant appears, and Coop has a spotlight on him suddenly. This, to me, means that Agent Cooper, with his life-threatening wound, has entered a transcendent state of consciousness, 
which is now in direct contact with the afterlife, as embodied by the giant. Now, the giant seems to have foreknowledge of who will live and who will die, as well as being able to predict certain events, which he imparts some of that information to Agent Cooper in the form of three things. Now, Cooper asks the giant, this is a very key moment, he asks the giant, where do you come from? To which the giant replies, the question is, where have you gone? So there's no doubt in my mind that Agent Cooper is not having this conversation in the realm of the living, but has indeed entered into some sort of expanded level of, of consciousness, a place where he may intuit the most promising clues in an attempt to solve Laura's murder. Of course, Agent Cooper was never intended to solve the crime to which he was assigned to in the story, just as, where, uh, just as we were never destined in life to have all the answers revealed to us. But just like this creative process, you know, you're, you have an idea comes to you, it, you, you follow that idea, you're led to a point, and then that point leads you to areas that you had no, like you had no possible idea that you would even have gone to those places, but you're certainly glad you did. So that's part of this journey. And of course, the giant in this scene is only offering trivial clues instead of profound answers, which is exactly the point and that's analogous to this idea that when you are let when you follow just one idea to a certain point and then it leads to other places new doors open after you take that initial step then things really start to get rolling you wouldn't you know if you didn't take that first leap of faith those other possibilities would never have opened in the first place and that's exactly what the giant represents here now, one thing we have to remember about Lynch is that, you know, he is, uh, his art is existential, as, just as existential as it is transcendent. So in other words, the genius of Lynch is that in his art, there truly is something for everybody if you look closely. Of course, not everybody or even most uh, most bodies are curious enough or brave enough to consciously contemplate or take that leap of faith um, to explore the hidden and occulted aspects um, beyond, you know, beyond the world of appearances. So take Lynch's, this is a, a piece from uh, that Lynch created um, in 1979 called Fish Kit. And it's a sort of ready-made art piece that is a sort of a parody on children's toys, but it's got a really deep message here. And the brilliance of so crudely dissecting a fish uh, with the provided questions and instructions that are on here, invoke a response in the viewer which span anywhere from disgust to comedy to wonder, spirituality, or uh, maybe even hunger. Now, good artists cause us to pause and to try to make sense of what is being, what are we looking at here, right? But great artists uh, not only want us to consider the possible interpretations of the work itself, but within those possible interpretations or our own reactions or thoughts that are invoked by a piece of art like this, the artist is communicating to us in a way which transcends the work itself, leading us into a deeper discovery of the very world in which we inhabit. So if we take that step and we we, we follow that idea. We don't know the next place it will lead to, but if we do take that first step, we go to that place. So, yeah, this fish kit is just, uh, I think this is great. <laughs> there was, so there was something, um, I'm an old person, there was something, some kind of obsession with, with fish, and there was even like, you know, in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, I remember there was a song, a very popular song called Fish Heads. And um, for some reason, I don't know if Lynch had anything to do with that, but there was a song called Fish Heads. And it just went, fish heads, fish heads, yummy, yummy fish heads. And it kind of just went on and on and on uh, down that line um, throughout the entire song. 
but it's a wildly popular song and i remember it was it was actually on the radio and people were really into it for some reason so i don't know how that that memory uh, got triggered but uh yeah it was a weird time to live i'll just tell you that <laughs> 